Welcome data enthusiasts. I'm Joseph from Zuma and this is Data for Good. Our podcast is brought to you by Zuma. We're a dedicated recruitment consultancy for senior data insights and analytics professionals, connecting you with Berlin's most influential and innovative companies. On today's Data for Good podcast, I'm very pleased to be joined by Emilia Trin. Emilia is business analyst for data at ImmoScout24 in Berlin. As a senior data professional, Amelia does business, data, and product analysis for product teams at ImmoScout. Welcome, Amelia. How's it going today? Hi, Joseph. I'm really good. How are you today? Good. Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, again, because we've just had a... Yeah. <laughs> um, well, good to hear you doing well. And to begin, as we do with all guests, could you tell us about your unique and personal journey into data? How did you first discover your passion for the world of data? Yeah. Um, so I studied computer science and business administration here in Berlin. And while I was studying, I was working with one of the more bigger traditional banks here in Germany. So I did my traineeship there first, and then I studied computer science and business administration. And for my bachelor thesis back then, I wanted to do something with AI and machine learning, because to me, these were like also very major buzzwords back then. And I just wanted to understand like, what's the technology behind it? Um, what is AI? What is machine learning? How does it work? And so I had the opportunity to join a data team, um, which is part of the subsidiary of that um, bigger corporate or bigger bank that I was working back then. And that was my very first entrance to the data world, I would say, yeah. Mm, interesting, okay. Could you feel it as you were doing, could you feel the passion growing as you did computer science and business at university? Um, so I or the connection like, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was really interesting or in general, very relevant for the future to understand like all those kind of technologies, also understand how to code and having like this logical component that mm -hmm. accompanied, um, yeah, was there throughout the whole years of studies. Um, and for me, solving a problem if you just keep it like on a more abstract level it's also being like some kind of like creative because you can solve a problem from different angles you can approach it differently and in terms of data science and data i would say um within my last semester um i got introduced to python and data science a bit mm. um and then connecting it with my work for my bachelor thesis and being able to train a module by myself, work with data, work with SQL, and um, just to see how it could be applied for a product. Um, that was pretty cool, yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, my, my degree, not to talk about me too much, my, my degree was in international business and I had a couple of modules in computer science and stats and accounting, but Unlike you, as my time at university progressed, I started to veer towards the human side and the kind of organizational behavior side. And mm -hmm. that's that's led me to where I am today. So funny uh, how the, the paths have gone quite differently. Definitely, yeah. Um, but that's not what we're here for today. Uh, I am acutely aware Obviously, you've just joined Immo Scouts um, related to the real estate industry, but you've also just departed from nearly 10 years in data for the banking and, and fintech domain. And this is an area that Zuma, uh, us recruitment people, we're also pretty invested in um, as data recruiters in Berlin. For that reason, and there are many data stakeholders in Berlin, in FinTech. I'd love to hear about your, your reflections and your expert knowledge uh, of, of that domain from a data analytics or data science perspective. Yeah. How's that sound? 
Sounds really good. Yeah, I'm happy to share what I have experienced so far. <laughs> cool. Excellent. Um, so today, topic loosely data in finance, and I know you, one of your passion areas is data storytelling. So yeah, let, let's uh, link that up as we go. Firstly, as the banking domain has evolved, many people, well, most people, uh, interact with banking and finance on web apps and mobile apps. Could, could you tell me what, what's the major difference between traditional banking and fintechs? Yeah, so I'm sure there are like a lot of more official um, definitions for both of those terms. Um, and I'm also fully aware that I might like like the yeah, business knowledge here. Maybe someone who is more experienced here can t give you like a better explanation. But from my point of view, I would say like both parties, um, generally they serve um, the same. So they try to provide financial services to people. Um, and I had the chance to work, as you know, a couple of years with a bigger corporate within the financial industry, but also had the chance to work within like more startup like companies or like fintechs within like the broker um, crypto scene, for instance. Um, and for me, the difference is majorly in, within the setup and given that also how they do their businesses. So if we think about traditional banks or bigger corporates, I would say um, you can think of like very complex um, structures within the company itself. Um, and for fintechs, um, it's kind of like the complete opposite. I experienced very flat organizational structures. Um, and given that the communication channels were also very short in comparison to the traditional bank that I have been working with in the past. Um, and due to the fact that you have low flat hierarchies, um, the communication channels are shorter, changes and decisions are not done more easily and faster, I would say, because most of the time it's just maybe one or two people that you talk to. Um, and within a, like a traditional bank, you have to go to different departments, you have to have different conversations. So it slows procedures down, I would say. Mm. And um, I would say, given that fintechs um, have an advantage here because um, it allows them to optimize and adapt their services, the product and the business way faster in comparison to like big corporates. Um, and that makes them again so innovative, I would say, um, because um, yeah, they move faster, more agile, another buzzword here. Um, and I'm also sure they're like a lot of different factors, but if you, for instance, compare like the products of a fintech with the products from a traditional bank, um, most of the time they are so much easier, so much user friendly, and also a lot, like a lot cheaper than the one from a traditional bank because they don't have like all those hierarchies and they don't have like all those dif different people involved. Um, so yeah, I guess this is one major difference. Um, and um, yeah, another point to mention is also like the technologies, I would say. Um, so in the um, startup companies or startup like companies that I've worked with, we work like with new technologies, state of the art technologies. Um, I would say partially it's because what I have mentioned before, like decisions are made fast. So you don't need to get like approvals from somewhere else um, to use that technology. But also um, another thing that differs um, fintechs from banks is that they are not so strongly regulated as traditional banks. So what I experienced in the past is that um, being the, in this fast paced environment, we could explore tools um, and you, we, can just, we could just use them and also went into conversations with different companies that offer those tools um, without worrying like, okay, um, what will like legal department say or so. Right. Mm. And traditional banks, again, they need to go through different conversation departments, get approvals um, just in order to either be allowed to use a tool in with restrictions or what I have also experienced is that you just get like, the official no from, for instance, the data protection department. Um, mm. Yeah. And okay. um, there's a lot there, a lot yeah, of differences. 
yes. Um, I, I, and it, it, it's, yeah, it, it's typical of the new innovative environments versus the or uh, brick and mortar traditionalist environments. I just took a couple of notes. Decisions are made as opposed to decisions are delayed. User friendly yeah. environment, new tech, flat versus tall hierarchy, uh, simple versus uh, simplicity versus complexity, low regulation versus high. Lots of differences, all amounting to how how much a business can move forward. W yeah. With this, having experienced both of those environments, what were the challenges that you experienced as a data professional? Um, so next to the challenges or like maybe disadvantages for such a traditional bank that I just mentioned, um, there were quite a few, but if I would have to summarize it, I would say it's the mindset. Um, because due to all the advantages or benefits that I mentioned, I would say like fintechs or like in general tech companies or startups, they attract younger people. Um, so a lot of young and international people are working on the same product. So you have, I would say, often a common sense for how products should be developed or digital products. Um, and then you share the same mindset. And in one of my previous jobs, I was working for the subsidiary of a bank. So we were like, I had the chance to work in this fast paced environment, but we had to collaborate and also report to the parent company. Um, so I could experience both sides at the same time. And mm. I just saw, you could just see like the different mindsets, like within that subsidiary, um, there was like this more agile um, and user centric mindset. Um, and within the bank, it was most of the time like very business oriented, um, less user centric. Um, so yeah, this was, if I just keep it like on that level, the mindset was a bigger challenge. Mm, the mindset, got it. Mm -hmm. Digital yeah. natives working with other digital natives to innovate in, in a way that they've come to realize is, is the only way of doing things. Exactly, yes. Okay, thank you for giving us that foundation, that background there. As a business analyst still, or rather as a business analyst and previously as a data scientist, I know storytelling is a big part of um, your world and being able to influence and uh, get to the solution that you need to do. Talk us through data, data storytelling. Yeah. So um, why I think data storytelling is so important or a crucial part of being like a data person, so to say, is that um, also just based on what I have experienced in the past, because as a data scientist back then, I provided the bank the corresponding or respective data that they required. But um, most of the time I saw or I experienced that um, decisions were then still made on like based solely on gut feeling or static statistics were cherry picked, etc. And of course, it's kind of like frustrating for a data person because you spend mm. like all the hours on analyzing and providing the results. But I also soon realized that it's not only about the mindset of your stakeholders, but it's also the way you communicate and how you approach um, data requests. And that's why I got more or less into data storytelling. So I guess for most people, at least from what I have experienced so far as data storytelling, most people would say it's something like how you communicate your data, how you visualize your data. But for me, it's much, much more. It kind of starts already with the request that comes from the stakeholder. And next to that, I would also say as a data person, you need to have like a sound knowledge about your stakeholders about um, the product or the service that the company you're working with is providing. And of course, the users, if we talk about digital products, you should know your users. Um, and with this knowledge, um, and when a request comes in, you need to understand um, where your stakeholders coming from. So what we tried to reinforce in the past 
within the teams that I have been part of was that we asked them like, okay, why do you need this data? What will you do with the data once you receive it, right? To also um, enable the stakeholders to think beyond the point where they just get the results and be like, oh, okay, good, now I know it. But also going beyond, okay, now, you that, now that you know it, what will you do? Will you optimize, I don't know, a certain flow, a screen or the product itself? And um, so, yeah, first step is generally just understand the bigger picture, know your stakeholders, know your audience, like who is going to see all the results and the data. And of course, like know the business vision behind your service or product, et cetera. Um, because I, as a data person, I know the data. I know what is available within the data warehouse, but my stakeholder is not aware, aware of it. So as, my, as a mm. data person, I see the responsibility in providing the data to answer like the main request, but also back it up with further information. Um, hey, yeah. okay. Sorry to interrupt. Something's sure. occurred to me, uh, and I hadn't really thought about this before. Um, you, your task is to present the data, and it's the data that your stakeholders would be looking for. Is, is there a risk or an opportunity, whichever way you look at it, for data bias for you as a data storyteller to put a seriously strong bias on it, especially if in your case, and I'm not, I'm not referring to you, but in the case of somebody like you who is working in or has worked in this traditional historical way of working, but also with digital natives who work in a certain way, and you want to influence these traditionalists for your storytelling is there a risk for any data scientist to impose and put their bias on things of course there's always a risk because in the end we are all humans we all go into a certain situation with certain assumptions so we're all biased um and what i have learned in the past what really helped me was um getting a holistic view on the product and on the users maybe also using the product by myself clicking through all the funnels um, talking to other people within the team if you have researchers within the team talk to them get to know um, or gather all the information that they um, received during interviews or surveys from um, the users because as a data person you usually just work with quantitative data but researchers they have qualitative data they might know the purpose uh, motivation or incentives of users mm. um, that use your product um, and next to that i would say try to also get like a fresh pair of eyes when you do analysis or present or you create your presentation get another colleague ask for their feedback because maybe it's even like helpful to have someone who is not involved in your domain. So they will also ask the right question. This is excellent. We're almost um, verging into the advice section of the podcast. Um, and I get it. It's sound advice. Do your research, speak to other stakeholders um yeah all salient points i think and then sorry the final point was get a second pair of eyes yes so and of course perspective of course in terms of data storytelling there's also the actual storytelling part where you communicate your results right and i think what i have also done in the past um and where i try to improve and i'm still trying to improve on that but what i have also seen is Usually if you present your data or your results, um, most of the reports are not user-friendly um, because as a person who spends hours on analysis and on the results, you know your data, you know each plot tells you what kind of in story or what kind of plot, uh, what plot in, um, provides which kind of insight. But mm. as someone, who's then looking for the very first time on your dashboard or report, it's just most of the time overwhelming because people put so many different plots and information on one page, for instance. And for me, it's really crucial 
to think like, okay, how are you going to present um, your results? Is it in front of a live audience? Then I would try to have like a more minimalistic approach where I just communicate per slide, per screen, one information. And the screen I would use to just reinforce what I tell people so that people, when they look at the screen, they don't focus on all the plots and all the numbers and forget what I'm saying or vice versa. And if mm -hmm. you're going just to share the information, like you forward it via mail or in a written form, then I would say, okay, then you can put a lot of information in there because that person that's going to look at this, they will spend a decent amount to understand mm. it. Yeah. So it's where, where you want the attention. They're, they're good presentation skills as well, I'd suggest. Yes. Don't have all the information behind you on this screen. It comes from me, the storyteller who's trying to influence. Exactly. Exactly. I get what you're saying. And in the context of the banking and fintech, domain how has this evolved since your since your career has evolved in, in data science um you mean it now in regards to the data storytelling or yes yeah, specifically yeah so um i would say like in big corporates you usually have either like big large excel sheets where like the business sites work with the data within that and if you provide them numbers um, they want normally like classic plots or just a table of numbers, etc. cetera. Um, and we tried in one of the previous um, teams that I was part of, we tried to reinforce this like, hey, we join, for instance, your review meetings and we are going to share what we have done. And now you have to listen. You just don't get like a number passed on. Um, but a lot of times what I have seen in the past is that stakeholders they would think like oh that's super interesting or they just cherry pick the statistics or the metric and say like okay so now we should decide on this but they completely forget for instance that what we showed them was just like behavioral data we don't know anything about our users we just know how they behave but what are their incentives behind it so maybe take mm. also research data into consideration so this is still like coming back to the mindset challenge um mm. and within fintech i would say um, it's different, like people, they use different tools, um, stakeholders are more um, data driven, and they are also more empowered to, for instance, explore dashboards on their own, because you know, I need to have this data in order to, um, yeah, improve my product, yeah. Mm. Well, would that suggest, or what does that suggest about the education of users or users being much more sophisticated with the use of data and understanding yes. the power of data as a product for example yeah yeah definitely so um what i have experienced is the more um dominant no not the dominant but um the more we talked to stakeholders back then in the bank and showed them what we are capable of the more curious they got um up to a certain point where they also like raised their own hypothesis and wanted to run a b tests so this was like um very exciting and it was fun because you went away from those basic requests to mo a more experimental approach um and we also try to, um, at least in one of the fintechs that I was working, um, we tried to have like dashboards where stakeholders could just calculate their own KPIs so that they don't have to bother us, bother us with like day to day requests or like basic requests, but that we have time to run like more sophisticated analysis or work on bigger and more relevant analytical projects. Mm, mm. so yeah that that shows that shows how the people within the banking domain banking and fintech have evolved they they've come to realize the importance and power of data so they're asking you they're curious about yeah. you know ways to use their data that's cool and fundamentally necessary right yeah. for the uh, banks to stay relevant yes yes what do you think lo looking back now what are the opportunities for data as a product within that banking domain so um if we talk about data as a product 
um, which is like for me like kind of like a subset of different data products that you can um, provide to your customers. And in terms of banking, I would say like you can have um, much features are based on AI or machine learning, recommending people like how um, they should, I don't know, manage their finances or educate them how they can better finance their man uh, how they can better manage their finances. Um, or just um, targeting um, people better and providing more individual finance management. Um, if you use the data in the right way, you will ultimately ask the right questions. You will know your users. You understand how users use your product better. And we should not mm. forget that online behavior is learned behavior. So once we understand our users, we can adjust or optimize our digital product. Our users will be confronted with it and they will adapt and change the behavior. And then it's kind of like a cycle that the data teams again can ask like, further questions, or again, maybe the same questions, just to see, okay, does this change affect anything within our user behavior? Um, did it help our customers, et cetera? Um, so, yeah. Awesome. I, I know you've only just started at Emo Scout, but I, I wonder, given the, the online nature of the real estate world now, what could be the opportunities there as, um, with data as a product that maybe they're not already doing? Yeah, so I have um, seen that there were like uh, various data products within Scout already, and um, they also made use of AI and machine learning. So there are dedicated data science teams um, that try to train the right models to, I would say, um, on a higher level just to level up the user experience, targeting the customers better. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's definitely still, a lot. there is already something going on. And I'm sure because I don't know what their roadmap looks like, um, but I'm sure they will also have much more planned. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Great opportunity that lies ahead for you. And a, a great way to kind of not only use the skills that you've developed but also pivot to a new area do, do you see any challenges in your uh moving from fintech to what do we say real estate tech yeah i guess you can say that um <laughs> um i would say it's just like um the biggest challenge for me is that it's like it's a complete different domain or industry so I definitely need to gather the um, required domain knowledge. And that's what I'm, I've been working on the past few weeks. Understanding like, okay, who are your users? How do, you, who, how do they use your, your product? And they have different incentives, right? Um, comparing to someone who's using a banking app. <laughs> because of yeah. someone who uses a banking app, they want to finance them. Uh, they want to manage the finances or transfer money. And someone on the real estate side, they are seeking for different stuff. They have different needs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but it's with, also with, fun. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. With the topic of data storytelling and them being different users with different needs, what will that look like for you in practice, data storytelling? Will you adopt different methods? Will you storytell? Uh, using different visualizations? Will you reach out to different levels of stakeholders? Yeah. What will it look so like? My um, first steps for now or actions are for now to get to know my stakeholders as um, yeah, in the best way and also to talk to other analysts that have worked with the data in the past and also trying to understand like where's the data coming from? How does the underlying data structure looks like? Um, and then we also use a different tool, um, the I tool, a different visualization tool. So I also get need to get familiar with this. And of course, I need to observe first, um, how are people telling stories here? Like, is it more or less just sharing it with the stakeholders and they should get the information by themselves? Or once you have done a report, um, 
do you communicate and share it or present it to your stakeholders? And if so, um, how, what is like their, I would say, um, approach? Like, do stakeholders uh, enjoy that or do they just want to have like tables and raw numbers? So this mm -hmm. is all, these are all points I need to consider before I can then like, start doing my own stuff. I need, I, I'm sure I need to adapt. Adapt and grow, no doubt. Yes. I, can I ask, on the storytelling topic, are there certain visualization tools out there, be it Power BI, Looker, Tableau, that are that are better than others, in your opinion? Um, so I have major. I have worked um, with Tableau in the past a lot, um, and I really enjoyed it. It's very user friendly. Um, it has also this story function. So you can yeah, tell stories or at least um, you don't have to show like plots um, only. Um, and it's really easy to utilize. Um, and right now I work with another tool which is called MicroStrategy. I would say mm -hmm. in a sense from what I have seen before, it's more powerful than Tableau. Um, and what I have also worked with in the past is, for instance, Google Data Studios. Um, also easy to use, user friendly, but um, I would say it's not comparable with like Tableau or MicroStrategy, for instance. And um, in terms of all the other BI tools like Power BI or Looker, I haven't made any experience on that so far. So um, yeah, I don't have an opinion on that. Okay, and and no conscientious. Uh, or no contentious opinion either. Yeah. Very good, very good. Uh, Emilia, uh, it's been great exploring both of those topics with you, the uh, fintech versus banking domain for data analysis and also data storytelling. At this time, I'd like to ask you as a senior data professional for your advice to the data community. So, from what you've experienced in, in your data domain or your world, what advice would you give to a, a data scientist who's trying to navigate their career or even move into data science? Yeah. Um, so my first advice or like the advice that I would give such kind of person is don't focus on machine learning or AI too much or like this technical, um, all those technical tools um, too much because you will learn it either way, I would say, but what you cannot learn or what you should learn, not what you cannot learn, what you definitely also should learn or consider is that being a data scientist or in general, that's why I also say data person because this definition and the exact role expectation differs from company to company or industry. Um, just in general, being a data person, you need to have like um, a very wide, a portfolio of skills if you say it in that yeah can you say it like this wide portfolio mm, skills, mm -hmm. skills portfolio yes so you need to be like of course technical but you also need to have like social skills and with social skills i mean um talk to your product managers or um software engineers or researchers or q a or designers like everyone who is involved in that product because they will help you to understand your product better or the users or in general, the data that you will work, end up working with in the end. And that would lead me to the ultimate advice is to always try to understand the bigger picture, get the bigger picture. Um, before you run analysis, um, try, as I mentioned earlier, try to understand as much as you can, because in the past I have seen data scientists training modules on features and they did not know anything about their users. They didn't even know how the feature worked. And for me, it was like, how can you tell the machine learning model what data to take in if you don't know your users or how they use the product? Because you then cannot say what's behind the data, right? What does it actually tell you? Um, so yeah, this would be my advice to try to get a holistic view on your users, your product, your service, your business, whatever, 
and also talk to the people that you will end up working with, not only your stakeholders, but everyone who's involved. Um, and what also really helped me in the past was um, stay curious, which also leads to get the bigger picture, but also in terms of if you work with data, I always want to know where is my data coming from? What kind of automated jobs are behind it? Um, how is it maintained? And if you don't get the chance because the structures are not enabling you to do so, um, get the chance to at least know the data engineer or the other engineering team behind it. So that mm -hmm. if you have questions or if you face difficulties, you can at least contact them. Um, in one of my previous jobs, we had the chat, we had the luck that we had one data engineer and he was very open to share how he's um, creating the pipelines, um, how his scripts look like. So when I see weird pattern within my data, I could always go to the source and have a closer look at the script so I can understand where my data is coming from and how it's produced and where potential pitfalls will lie. Yeah. There's a lot to take in there, Amelia. Thank you for all that. <laughs> a lot of advice. <laughs> yeah, it's so much. I um, I took notes throughout, actually, things that were um, pertinent to me. Um, communicate far and wide. So lots of different stakeholders, but also your data people, particularly the engineers, to understand them and how they get data, how reliable it is, the level of quality, but then also the business side or the big picture side, having that holistic view of um, why this data is being used and what for. Fantastic. And then the other topic in the early stages, don't worry too much about learning the specifics of AI and ML. That will that will come throughout your career. I, yeah. I do see that on junior um, junior professionals' profiles. This this sense that they have to learn um, the most innovative tech right now or the most innovative approaches right now. And, and managers often say to us, we, we don't need that. We need the foundations and we need to know that um, they're going to approach this with a, a communicative um, and holistic view. Yes, exactly. I mean- Thank you so just, much. If I can say one last- uh, Yes, please do, please matter, do. Like, um, if you don't bring like a solid knowledge with it mm -hmm. um, and you can have like the best performing module, but we all know this, uh, the saying garbage in garbage out. So the module can be accurate um, and well performing, but if you don't know your users or your data, then of course the module can't perform in a way that it will serve you. So, yeah. Mm, great. And you gave a, a prime example of that earlier as well. Yes. Understand those users. Amelia, that's all we've got time for today. Thank, thank you, you, Joseph. <laughs> hey, you're very, very welcome. And thank you too. Thanks for going into the real details around your experience in banking and fintech, but also your approach to data storytelling. I'm sure that that will be powerful and really useful for the data community. So yeah, once again, thank you very much for that. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I hope that my um, yeah, knowledge that I shared might be helpful for some people. Awesome. And you could even go a step further. I ask if we have any listeners or viewers that have questions, feedback, comments, um, certainly let me know and I can push them uh, towards Amelia or um, yeah, drop, drop us all a note and, and we will all address it accordingly. Sure. So yeah.